So hello everyone, welcome, and uh, thanks for all coming along to this session to uh, hear all about Barclay's story. So a great man once said, context is king, and that's really why I'm here today, just to give you a little bit of context before this, uh, before this session. So my name's Rob Charlton, I'm a solutions architect with AWS, and uh, I've had the privilege of working with Barclays over the last couple of years on their journey to the cloud. So who are Barclays? If you don't know, Barclays are a British bank. They're what's called a universal bank, which means they have operations in investment banking, corporate banking, retail banking, cards and payments, wealth management, so a very broad operation. They're also what's known as a systemically important financial services institution. And what that means is that's a small group of companies whose scale, size of operations, global reach, complexity means that they form a fundamental part of the globe's financial institutions. So Barclays uh, has about 80,000 employees, got about 25,000 extremely good looking tech employees as well. They have operations in over 50 countries. They can trace their history back more than uh, to 329 years. So think about that for a second, the amount of events that that company has seen in its history since it started in 1690, it's quite incredible. So an organization of that size and scale deciding to move any part of its operations to AWS represents a profound choice. This is a, and we recognize that, it's quite humbling really that they should choose to do that into AWS. But it's not quite as simple as just picking up a payment system and then dropping that into AWS. Because Barclays is also a highly regulated entity. And what that means is they have to show to regulators in various jurisdictions, financial jurisdictions all around the world, and then be audited, demonstrating that they're looking after not only their own interests, but the interests of their customers, looking after their customer data, making sure it's all encrypted and protected and ensuring the integrity of any financial transactions that take place on their platform. So that's why two years ago at uh, reInvent 2017, um, Barclays were on stage here in a breakout session. Uh, if you Google for farewell to a trade-off, reInvent 2017, you can watch it on YouTube. Not right now then, afterwards. Um, and in that session, Kieran Broadfoot and Jonathan Turner, two of Barclays architects, laid out how they were going to build a uh, secure foundation for Barclays to build in the cloud and then put these workloads on top, either newly built workloads or workloads migrated from their own data centers. So it's really exciting, I think, today to be able to see the next chapter in that story and to be able to share that with you because now Barclays have built that foundation, they have that in place, and they're starting to be able to exploit this cloud platform that they have and be able to use it to uh, change their business and really take advantage of the strengths of the AWS cloud. So with that, I'm really delighted to be able to share this session with you today with one of those workloads. This is the research data science platform. So please, give a nice warm welcome to Bill McQueenie and Wojciech Kral from Barclays, who'll tell you their story. Thank you, Rob. And thank you, everyone, for coming to our session today. I'm Bill McQueenie, and I'm a director in Barclays CTO department. And in, to provide a springboard to our session today, where we will describe how we overcame challenges when building our research data platform using AWS services, I'd first like to quickly connect why we in Barclays feel that data science is so very important. Now, as we all know, there's been an explosion in the availability of affordable, on-demand uh, storage, memory, and compute. Now, this burst in infrastructure has led to an investment in analytics, and consequently, there's been a growth in the capability and even the formation of data science as its own speciality, which taken all together has driven the monetization of increasingly large data sets 
to derive, it, uh, to derive insights that were previously out of our reach. Now, not keeping up with these advancements could be considered by some unwise. And by others, not even an option, as it could risk missing out on new business opportunities or not keeping up with competitors. And in Barclays, to facilitate our data scientists, we have created a research data platform to analyze and extract insights from third-party data sets. And later in our presentation, Wojtek will share a detailed example of how sentiment analysis of social media posts is being used to track success of product launches and marketing campaigns. Now, the direct benefits of the research data platform to our business include enabling our data scientists to import really large data sets, provision resources quickly to execute public and private Python modules running on Spark clusters. However, with the, the ultimate aim of extracting market insights from data sets at a greater velocity than was previously possible. However, to realize these benefits, a number of challenges needed to be overcome. And in this session, we will share with you how we overcame these challenges faced on premise using a number of technologies and techniques available to us in AWS. Now, our guidance is going to cover several meaty topics, achieving agility in a controlled environment, managing big data analytics environments, and infrastructure optimization. Now, um, before we provide any more detail on how we overcame these challenges, let's remind ourselves of the tensions and of the challenges. There's a recognized tension between agility and control and security. These seemingly competing requirements often have different stakeholders within an organization, such as <coughs> application delivery teams and central IT functions like uh, infrastructure and security. Now, control and security are not requirements that can be deprioritized, and, and therefore increasing agility while maintaining a controlled environment becoming an increasing challenge. And this tension and associated challenges are exacerbated when working in a controlled or regulated environment, where it's not only important to maintain security, but also demonstrate systematic control in the, of the actual environment. And failure to uphold uh, control and security can result in extremely large financial penalties, significant reputational damage, and even loss of business. However, on the other hand, poor agility or reduced productivity may also result in missed business opportunities, losing out to competitors, loss of revenue, and ultimately, reduced profit. Now, this seems to make uh, a win-win situation hard to achieve. However, we in Barclays have found that by adopting AWS, we've managed to improve agility whilst actually maintaining or even improving security. And for our research data platform, we selected AWS um, to not only enhance delivery speed via uh, quicker infrastructure provisioning, easier platform maintenance, but also adding more efficient and better uh, control options into the environment, <coughs> therefore achieving as much of a win-win as is possible. Therefore, what follows is a brief description of four specific challenges familiar to those working with this tension and the solutions we found to overcome these challenges, including architectural changes, changes to permissions, and changes to human systems. We'll also provide our insights, learnings, and tips for the top when attempting to increase agility while maintaining or even improving security and control in this regulated environment. And now I'm going to hand over to Wojtek, who will provide more context. Thank you, Bill. Hello, everyone. My name is Wojtek Kral, and I'm a research data science platform engineer in a research IT in Barclays. And before we dive deeper into the challenges and actual solutions to them, I would like to introduce you to a little bit more of a context of which business these challenges were solved for. Research business. Research business is the department that delivers differentiated market insights, actionable ideas, and research across asset classes. And this is delivered through publications 
global conferences, one-to-one -one analyst time, and premier events. And as you may correctly assume, data has always been <coughs> important to our business. And historically, it's been mostly traditional financial data sets. Example of these are, for example, stock prices, or corporate fundamentals, such as revenues or earnings. And about two years ago, research business started investigating more closely the use of alternative data sets. And they created teams to use sophisticated data science. And this initiative is to deliver differentiated market insights combining traditional research, alternative data sets, and data science. And we, in research IT, embarked on a journey to support this initiative. And we decided we're going to build the research data platform, as Bill mentioned. We wanted to give our users the environment where they can investigate both, or work with, both traditional financial data sets as well as alternative data sets. We also wanted to give them tools and the environment where they can quickly test hypotheses and experiment because this is very essential and important part how they work. And also we wanted to give them tools to be able to schedule the models when the needs be. And now on to our first challenge. So first challenge is downloading large external data sets. And we're going to be talking about the solution that we believe is well reusable for our colleagues inside Barclays, but also the key points and design patterns we think might be very well usable for you in your areas. So let's get to it. This challenge regards the category of data sets from the alternative data sets. The structure is typically semi-structured and the sizes ranges around tens to hundreds of terabytes. And when we got our first use case to import a data set from external vendor from their S3 bucket, which was obviously external to Barclays, we first looked into the on-premises solutions. And we found two main challenges. The first one might be more obvious, and it was a challenge regarding storage. Not all the environments were ready to host such a size of a data, and we would have to go through a hardware procurement process to increase the storage to accommodate the size, which would obviously take time. The second challenge, which might be less obvious, is a challenge regarding bandwidth. So as we were going through this process, finding a solution, we realized we have to keep in mind the bandwidth, because if you take an example, let's say if you had 100 terabytes of data, and you are importing it at a one gigabit per second speed, it would still take you around 10 days to get all the data. And then you can see how easily, if you have further limitations on the downloading speed, this can go into 10 and tens of days. Using on-premises solution, we would have to use a shared internet connection to download this data. And in order to be good citizens, we would have to be downloading at a speed which would mean longer times to download it. So because of these two challenges and because AWS adoption was getting a huge traction inside Barclays, we decided to take a look at how AWS could help us overcome these challenges. And before Bill will talk more details about the actual solution, let me give you a little bit more of a context. Doing this solution in these circumstances and under these constraints, we were about to come up with a, with a novel solution to import a data set. And we had to realize that this novel solution had to meet the standard requirements that are typical for the on-premises solutions. The most priority one was the area of control. So this novel solution, we had to ensure that it would not import any malicious files or it would not let any malicious files inside a corporate network. Also, we had to ensure that this solution could not be used to leak data out or leak data in. Then the second requirement that we set for ourselves was around, around, around speed. And of course, speed of performance of downloading the data, but also speed of delivering this solution to the business. And this ties to the last point about minimal change. And what I mean by that 
is we were given for this project an AWS account by a center infrastructure team. And it had certain guardrails, policies, and limitations. And we were looking and answering a question of what is the absolute minimal set of changes we had to do to this account that was given to us in order to achieve our goal. And the reason for that was the least amount of change we do, the easier it is to be reviewed by our colleagues from security and compliance and to be able to prove that this novel solution is meeting the highest standards of the company. And now, let's hear from Bill about the details of the solution. Okay, so before walking us through the actual solution, I'm just gonna provide a, a little bit more background. Thank you. And the approach Barclays had taken was to create uh, vended accounts with pre-configured guardrails. And this provides a number of security benefits, especially when operating at scale. And we're gonna be moving thousands of applications into the bank, uh, into, into AWS, uh, that most of which only require internal connectivity. And as you can see in the diagram, there's no direct inbound or outbound internet connectivity via an AWS internet gateway or an app gateway. And in addition, S3 access is allowed via, only allowed via VPC endpoints. And access to buckets outside of the account is blocked. Now this controlled security provides an extremely strong barrier to potential external threats or data leakage. But it also means without making any changes to the account structure, it'd be necessary to download the data via um, the, the, the vendor data in S3 via an on-premise web proxy. And in this is instance, all of the necessary controls such as virus scanning, um, content filtering, and data loss prevention would be provided by the central proxy. And that makes it easy for us. But unfortunately, this route uh, involves sharing of the direct connect link and also the on-premise internet pipe with other tenants. And this would introduce the bandwidth and therefore time to market constraints that Wojtek mentioned. Therefore, we look for a solution where we could make use of AWS's network backbone in order to improve the throughput whilst maintaining uh, security and control. And here's that solution. A server-side sync is issued still via uh, the um, on-premise web proxy to transfer the data from the vendor bucket uh, to the staging bucket. But by use of a server-side sync, we elim eliminate the bottle introduced by the on-premise proxy. Now, given that control and security were really key requirements uh, to our build, we paid really close attention to our IAM permissions. And we looked to enforce the principle of least privilege wherever possible. Now, the user or process requesting uh, the import of the data only had permissions to read uh, the vendor bucket. Um, in terms of write permissions, they were given write permissions to the staging bucket, and also list permissions, just but only so they could check the progress of, uh, of the uh, download. In order to maintain the integrity of the airlock, uh, read access to the staging bucket was heavily, um, heavily protected. So a Lambda job uh, was triggered by S3 events. So as soon as a file was dropped into the staging bucket, it would trigger a Lambda job. And this Lambda job would um, perform the virus scanning as well as content validation, and that was to ensure that the files that were downloaded were um, of the type we were expecting, um, that they were structurally sound, and that somebody wasn't trying to bring in something that potentially could be dangerous. So if the, lam if the Lambda job detected a problem, be that a virus or uh, a broken file of some sort, it would be moved to the quarantine bucket. But as you'd hope, in most cases, uh, the file would actually be transferred to the target bucket. And this target bucket was located in a, a second account, the application account. Uh, progress of scanning was monitored via CloudWatch, CloudWatch logs, and tags were written to the S3 objects in order to help with traceability. So in terms of guardrails, we had to add our own um, guardrails into the scanning process. And these involved um, locking down the, uh, the S3 buckets so only um, specific VC, uh, VPC endpoints could be used to, to access them. The Lambda job also had very restrictive IAM permissions. But also it was run 
inside of its um, own non-routable VPC. And that meant that it had greater isolation. So um, if there was any problem with the Lambda job, um, it wouldn't be able to reach out to the rest of the account or even the rest, the rest of our environment. <clears throat> oh, sorry, come back. So similarly, the use of two separate accounts. Uh, this, these were used to help with segregation of duties. And it was important for a developer of the application to not have permissions to change critical processes or controls that, um, such as the scanning process. Now we've got a few tips to, to share with you, and here's the, the first of them. We found that investing time in, uh, in good iron policies saved us a considerable amount of time. Ensuring policies are, that are easy to read resulted in much quicker reviews with colleagues both inside and outside of our direct team. Policies which were easier to read also resulted in fewer mistakes and were easier to maintain. Now the standard approach of using implicit deny, that's the absence of an allow statement, although being much more flexible, can be a lot harder to read. And this is because it requires evaluating the whole policy document for both the resource but also potentially all of the users and, and roles in the account. Now conversely, we found that using an explicit deny was much easier to read. Here we denied access not only to restrict unwanted access, but also just to restrict unnecessary access. And this meant that the policies were much easier to decipher and, and much easier to review. And this is because we could define the maximum scope in only a subset of a single policy. And given, given that that was on the re, a resource policy, we'd also know where to look for it. We also found that um, this provided security in depth by limiting the maximum permissions of any new users or roles that might be added into the system, therefore enabling safer addition of new users and roles. And this safety net would, could be particularly useful in the future uh, when the original project team are not around. Here's another tip that we'd like to share. In order to prove security and readability, we wanted to explicitly use, uh, we wanted to use explicit deny, as I just mentioned. And for this to work, we had to deny access to all principles apart from those which should have access. However, the use of assumed roles and identity federation which we use in our environment meant that we couldn't make use of a not principle condition, which would be your, your normal go-to uh, go condition. And this because it doesn't uh, make use of, uh, doesn't allow you to use wildcards. So that um, snippet on the screen is, is not something that's possible. However, we found a solution in a, an AWS blog. And this, we found, um, uses a, a string comparison method to achieve the, the requirement that we needed. Now, when we set out um, on this project, it was a little bit difficult to find this blog post. Um, but fortunately, it seems like search engines are in, indexing a lot better than they used to. So if you search for AWS explicit deny wildcard, it's likely it's going to be your top result. Therefore, in summary, all of the core requirements were delivered. Control was maintained. And the solution was reviewed and approved as a reusable pattern to fulfill the full scanning uh, requirements. A separate accounts were used to enforce segregation of duties. And specifically, with the ability um, to modify infrastructure being key for our application developers, but not giving them the opportunity to deliberately or accidentally disable important controls such as the scanning process. And performance, obviously that was the, the next key requirement for us. And we achieved, um, definitely achieved the objective there. Now there are a number of factors to consider that can sort of affect the uh, transfer rate. And these are the actual size of the files you're copying. So small files would have potentially a larger overhead. Um, also, warm up and warm down times in terms of S3 transfers. Because we were transferring many, many files um, in parallel, uh, our total number of files we were transferring was in the millions. Um, so that, that needs to be considered. And then also the, the length of time for the ex execution of your, your Lambda job, um, as this is performing scanning and, um, and virus scanning and content um, checking. Now, onto the actual speed we achieved. <coughs> We managed to get a full end-to-end -end transfer rate of three gigabytes a second, but it, and that's actually 25 gigabits a second. 
Now, if we just put that into perspective, if you were to download 100 terabytes, uh, 100 megabits, OK, it's not super fast by today's standards, that would take you 100 days of constant elapsed time. And if we were to improve that to one gigabit a second, you're still looking at 10 days. But via this process, we're able to bring that down to 10 hours. And of course, by this method, um, because we weren't making use of the on-premise internet pipe or even the direct connect link, uh, we wouldn't be taking up uh, valuable bandwidth um, to the detriment um, of our other users. Also, we found that we think it's probably possible to tune this to go faster. We haven't faced a need to do so. And on to minimal change. Use of an additional account for the airlock scanning process meant we um, could implement the uh, additional control, relax some controls and add other additional controls into the, the scanning account. And because no people were really given access to this account, there's, there's more we could do there. And in the, the existing application account, it was possible to change very few controls. And this meant that reviewing them and getting approval was much, much easier. Um, also, uh, it took us a lot less time to develop this solution than um, probably would have done if we tried to download the data at a reduced rate. And you may wish to consider a similar approach to this if you're either downloading huge data sets or regularly downloading large ones. And although we had um, a reasonable time saving along this project, probably the most important thing was the things that we actually learned. It was in, um, we developed our understanding of the control environment um, and new ways of working and this was, has been invaluable to us in that, and has actually helped us um, accelerate other projects. And we feel if we were to repeat an, uh, another exercise, something similar to this, those time savings would be quite considerable. And that leads on, uh, leads on to our lessons learned section. Sometimes, in order to find a solution, it's necessary to navigate complex human systems rather than attempting to solve complicated problems. The interactions between technology, processes, and standards can become very complex. And working as a team is really key to overcoming this. In our example, we benefited from close collaboration between security, infrastructure, and application teams. And at the heart of this was building trust and a better understanding together of the challenges, of the requirements, the constraints of the whole system. And from the outset, the high-level design and control requirements were co-developed amongst this wider group. And as the solution evolved, regular walkthroughs of uh, the code and the iron policies was taken. And this approach, rather than a standard, more retrospective paper review, helped with increasing transparency and building and maintaining trust. And the application team reported that this close relationship and ongoing dialogue meant that it was much easier to understand the intent of a policy. Um, and therefore, when necessary, if it is to make the process run faster, um, achieve qu quicker time to market, or actually improving the security, they're in a better place to suggest changes. And conversely, a uh, security consultant, having more in-depth knowledge, uh, felt more able um, to really understand what's going on in the environment, uh, also to look at um, alternative approaches and assess them, and where approvals from a higher board were needed to be sought, we're in a much better situation to provide good recommendations and therefore uh, achieve sign-off for these quicker. In addition, um, the, as the project continued, security consultants began expressing their controls in a way that was easier for application uh, uh, delivery team and developers to turn that into code and policies. Um, also, the developers, bit by um, this close relationship, started actually expressing their code and policies in a way that was better actually demonstrating the control and therefore could um, be reviewed a lot easier. And as an extension of this, um, we'd recommend that you consider using explicit deny, particularly within your resource policies. And this is because um, it not only improves security and robustness to change, for example, build, um, adding users and roles later down the line, but it also saved time in security reviews and helped build additional confidence in the solution. So moving on to our se second challenge. We're going to talk, uh, what we're going to talk about now revolves around traditional data sets 
and optimising our use of infrastructure. Now, the research team have an existing vendor application which provides traditional financial uh, data repositories, uh, including time series data. And these data sets are typically in the single terabyte range. Uh, and our business had a requirement to expand this data set by subscribing to additional attributes and, and additional dimensions. Now, unfortunately, our on-premise environment wasn't ready to take on this extra data, and it, um, to provision that extra storage would have uh, let, taken time that we didn't have in the project. In addition, the existing server was old, so the storage increase would require um, a new server and a platform upgrade in order to keep up with our technical debt. Uh, the solution we, uh, we took was to migrate the existing on-premise database into Amazon's relational database service, RDS. And the outcome of this was that the project was delivered in a quicker time than would have been possible on-premise. However, the, obviously the lasting benefit of this was by adopting RDS, we were decoupling the compute, the storage, and the database platform. And therefore, future upgrades, be that to the infrastructure, or to the, even the database software itself would be a much simpler task. Also, it's possible to maintain a, a much lower storage headroom for natural growth because additional storage can be added so quickly. And of course, the same would be applicable to uh, compute or memory upgrades. Now, one of our key lessons from this challenge um, was that there's a lot to be learned from a lift and shift migration. We had a faster time to market, um, but also um, the on ongoing maintenance of the platform would be much improved. However, although the migration to RDS was an extremely, extremely valuable one. It didn't come without its own specific challenges. So even though we didn't change the underlying database engine, there were a number of application con uh, configuration and script changes to it that were required. And being a vendor application, there's not always the opportunity to make these changes um, so, or so easily. Uh, an example of the things we had to change was uh, the, the bulk import process for pulling data into the database. And for this application, it was only practical to migrate the database first and leave the clients on premise. Uh, many of these being data, science, uh, data scientists who were accessing the repository from their workstation. Now this hybrid, uh, this hybrid hosting approach introduced greater complexity into the environment and therefore additional work. Uh, for example, because we're not in a uh, position to integrate Active Directory into the database, this meant we had to integrate sequence management and account, um, uh, account management for, for the database accounts into on-premise controls such as logical access management and associated recertification processes. This challenge was huge and should not be underestimated. Therefore, it's worth considering migrating all tiers of your application at once. Retrofitting security controls into the on-premise environment can sometimes take longer than actually moving those same components into AWS and using more native controls. And now I'm going to hand over to Wojtek for our next example. Thank you, Bill. Now let's take a look at our third challenge. The third challenge is based on the key requirement I was already mentioning before, and this is the need of our business to be able to quickly test hypothesis and experiment. So we wanted to give them the compute environment which would support this flexibility as high as possible. So in a sense, what we were about to give them was the tooling for big data analysis. And I believe many of you, when I say big data analysis on AWS, would start thinking about Amazon Elastic Map Reduce, possibly. And this is our target as well. But because, as I mentioned previously, we had certain guardrails in our account the EM, Amazon EMR was not avail available to us to be used yet. But we didn't want to wait for Amazon EMR to be available. We wanted to look at what we can deliver immediately to our business so that they can start driving client added value. And after discussing with our business, we decided we're going to build for them the custom Spark cluster with Jupyter Notebook. What I mean here by custom, custom means we're going to run it on EC2s configure it our, and manage it ourselves. And for people who might not know what Spark is, it is an engine for distributed data analysis. And Jupyter Notebook is the web browser-based environment where 
data scientists can go and they can write their code, run it, test it, and also interact with Spark. So we were looking at, okay, let's deliver this immediately, but we wanted to also to keep in our mind the fact we want to migrate to Amazon EMR later on. And a little bit more about the flexibility aspect. We decided we're going to aim for single tenant cluster in order to support to the flexibility I was talking about. Because we wanted to provide to our users the flexibility both in terms of the hardware that they can say how much CPU or how much RAM they want for their cluster. Also, on the other hand, we want wanted to provide them the flexibility in terms of a ha the cluster configuration that they can say which Python libraries they want or additional drivers they want. And the aim was also for this to go hand in hand with no contention aspect that they would not have to compete for resources and they would not get into a situation where their configuration <coughs> would not go well along with any, anyone else's configuration of the cluster. So this is what we design and build. And let me just walk you through that from the right hand side. So on the very right, you see one bucket and one Amazon RDS. And this is not to say we have just one bucket and one Amazon RDS. This is to depict that there are usually two types of a data that Spark cluster uses, and it would be unstructured or semi-structured, which we typically would put in Amazon S3, and then the more structured ones we would put in Amazon RDS. And then in the Amazon VPC, you can see the Spark cluster depicted by EC2 icon. So this is what we configure ourselves using scripts. And in order to give our users an easy ability to main, manage their clusters and maintain, in the middle, you can see the cluster manager, which is the Python web application that we've built. And this is the place, it has the web browser GUI and REST APIs behind it, and it is the place where our users would go to manage their clusters, you know, to list it, start, stop, terminate, and also to create. So just to give you a sense of a typical workflow. Let's say I'm a data scientist and I have a business job to accomplish and I have no clusters right now. So the first stop for me would be I go to the cluster manager and I start filling out the form. Obviously I say what's the name of my cluster, but most importantly I specify what are the types of a machine I want to have. How many I want to have. Is it single node, multi node cluster? Also I will specify which Python libraries I want to have installed additional drivers, and also if I know that my job needs it, I would have an option to override the defaults for the Spark configuration itself that we expose. Example of these would be memory for the executor, or memory for the driver. Then I just hit start, and this information is passed on to the web application, the Python code. We use AWS SDK, so we take the information and Using the methods, we start spinning up EC2s, assigning security groups, uh, mounting EBSs, etc. And we also pass the additional configuration of the Spark and Jupyter itself into the user data. And then after 15 to 20 minutes, the cluster is fully configured and ready for me to be used. So the next thing, I would navigate to Jupyter Notebook, and then I can start writing the code. I can start running it, testing, and evaluating it. The next steps would very much depend on the business case I'm trying to achieve. If, I wanted to, if I'm about to do just an ad hoc one-time analysis, I can finish the analysis on the cluster and then the results, for example, can be a plot that I produce in a Jupyter. I download to my workstation and then I pass on for further usage. Or, if I need a flat file with aggregated statistics, again, I do this on the cluster, for example, the Jupyter, download it, and then pass on for further use. If I need to have my job running scheduled, then we reused, again, the cluster manager heavily. So if you look at the right-hand side, we have a scheduler, and this is on-premises scheduler, which you know, we specify what time we need to trigger the job, then this schedule actually takes a JSON specification and passes it 
onto the cluster manager, onto a REST API. And this JSON file contains two pieces of information. One is the cluster configuration itself. This is the same that I was just describing. I fill in in that web browser GUI. The second type of information are the steps which should be carried out on the cluster. So after receiving this whole file, cluster manager spins up appropriate cluster, and then it passes the steps into the user data of EC2. Next thing we added is on EC2 itself, we have a custom steps interpreter. So what it does, it pulls down the steps from the user data and it starts going step by step, carrying them out. And we are very flexible on this front, but you can imagine it, it can be as simple as saying download a script from a central repository, submit it as a Spark job, and after you are done, terminate the cluster. The next thing I was talking about, we want to keep the migration to EMR in our heads. And we believe that actually doing this design, we sort of brace ourselves for that. So we envision that when we are migrating to Amazon EMR, we're going to be mostly changing the guts of the cluster manager itself. And if you think about it, we already have most, if not all, the information being passed on to the cluster manager that we would need to spin up Amazon EMR. So we would just, using Amazon as AWS SDK, use different methods. Instead of spinning up EC2s, we would be spinning up EMR. We would probably need to reformat the information or the JSON so that Amazon EMR understands. But regarding the content, the migration should be very smooth and also shield our users from any interruptions. So actually doing this, what we managed to achieve, we were able to deliver the solution to our business, the custom Spark build, in a very timely manner. And they are already using it to do their job. We also seen great examples of elastic scale and I completely love this anecdote. Once I was sitting behind my desk and I got a call from our data scientist and he was asking me, hey Wojtek, is it technically possible I would need to spin up 50, 24 extra large machines for just a couple hours because I have some historical data that I need to process just one time? And I said, of course, that's technically possible, go for it. And if you realize, so at that point in time, the person spun up something like 5,000 cores, 20 terabytes RAM of a cluster, did their job, and then after a few hours, the job was done, they could terminate the cluster to remove the cost. On to the topic of single tenant clusters, I was telling you that that was our aim, but we also got the great feedback from our business users that we were able to meet what we set for ourselves. The other day I was talking to a data scientist on a topic of single tenant, multi tenant clusters and how he was happy with our solution. And he had two main anecdotes. One, he really appreciated the flexibility in terms of a hardware configuration. Because when the data scientist has multiple projects, they can differ in the needs for a compute or RAM. So this way, they can spin up multiple clusters for different projects and keep every, all the clusters being stopped to be cost effective and only start the one they need to work on right now. And if a couple hours later they need to switch to work on another project, they just stop one cluster and start the other one that it has appropriate size for that project. He also appreciated very much the ability to specify the configuration of the cluster. And he mentioned to me that previously, when he worked in a multi-tenant environment, sometimes when he wanted or needed, that's better to say, to change the underlying cluster configuration, he had to go to the owners of the environment and they had to investigate if the configuration he wanted would not clash or clash with other users' configurations. But here, you just fill it out in the web form that you want to have a different Spark cluster configuration or different Python libraries, hit start, and you can easily go on. And a little bit more about the lessons learned. So one thing that we found very useful is, you know, pay attention what 
your target is, but also focus on what you can deliver right now. So this way, we believe we managed to deliver the solution to the business and also prepare ourselves for future migration to MR. Another benefit we saw in the having the abstraction layer in the terms of a cluster manager because we were able to quickly iterate even during the build. So when we were introducing the scheduled capabilities, we were able to quickly iterate and with almost no interruption to our business users. Custom features, very useful for our business where if you think about it, we can just present a one option or one radio button or checkbox to our users. And the fact that behind the scenes, we have to do multiple calls or we have to slice and dice the information to be able to achieve their goal. Our users are completely shielded from that fact. <coughs> and it's very comfortable for them. Also, the possibility for greater control over permission. So if you want to model your business or team permissions in a greater details, Example can be, you know, who can terminate my cluster? Is it me? Is it my boss? Is it my team? Is it the business owner, not my boss? So the possibility and flexibility on, on this end. Another thing regarding the single tenant clusters, besides what I mentioned previously, is we think there's a potential for single, single tenant clusters to be cheaper. When you think about it, because you are the owner of the cluster, you have the ultimate knowledge to when to stop it and when to start it. When there's a multi-tenant cluster, you would have to ask all other people if you can stop it, or you have to have some automated process to figure out when nobody's working on it. Also, the aspect of right-sizing. So as I mentioned, data scientists can have multiple different projects requiring different sizes of CPUs and different sizes of RAMs. And this way, they can just pick exactly the size they want for that project and have only the cluster running which they need to work on right now. And now let's take a look at the last fourth challenge. And this challenge is regarding better infrastructure utilization. And the application which had this challenge is a Twitter sentiment analysis and it, it's been developed in Python. And this application predates the initiative for Spark cluster, so it could not take advantage of it. And on a high level, what this application achieves is when our business wants to track sentiment of, for example, a product, an event, or, or a company, they specify a search term, this application pulls appropriate tweets according to the search terms, search queries, it does pre-processing, and then it uses machine learning to rate the sentiment. And when we started it, we decided we're gonna use on-premises container platform. And I have to say it was, this was a very good decision because it enabled us to quickly get the project up and running and showcase it to our business and iterate. And for storage, we chose NoSQL. As the application became more and more popular with our business and they wanted to track more and more search queries, we started running into two challenges. One was that although the container platform was perfect for getting project up and running, it was sort of a highly dense and consolidated multi-tenant environment. So it wasn't purposely built for a quick elastic scaling up and elastic scaling down which we would need to accommodate the higher and the lower volumes of incoming data over time. Then also, when we need to reprocess all the tweets because we store them, for example, when the model changes or when we have no new model to evaluate, it would also take a longer time. So we decided to migrate this application to AWS as well, and we picked AWS ECS. And I have to say, this migration was very smooth because we migrated from one container platform onto the other. Then once we were migrating compute, we also decided to migrate storage layer as well because as I said, we were keeping the tweets. So it was certain that at some point we would have to go through a hardware procurement process in order to increase storage on premises. So we decided let's migrate it as well with the compute. And given the structure of the data, we have mainly two types. 
the big one in size are the tweets. And this type of a data, they are accessed very infrequently. Of course, they are accessed at the beginning to be pre-processed and rated, but then they are accessed very infrequently. So we chose to put this data into AWS S3. The second type of data, which is much smaller in size and much more structured and also accessed much more frequently, are the results of the sentiment rating. So we decided to put this into Amazon RDS. And we saw several benefits. Elastic compute, scaling up and down regularly several times a day. Also for storage, more cost effective storage given the type of data and access patterns. And now, let's, let me just give you a business use case that this application powers. So here is a screenshot from a research publication that was published to our clients. And there was an event where a newcomer was entering Italian mobile market. And our business wanted to track sentiment for the newcomer and established competitors. And they wanted to track it before the event, during, and after. And the sentiment rating, ratings done by this application were, were then used by our business users in this publication, which was published to the clients. And now, Bill, would you summarize for us what we've learned? Thank you, Wojtek. So in summary, our lessons learned involve two key things control and security, and migration. And with regards to control and security, it's essential to consider how we navigate complex human systems rather than attempting to solve complicated problems. Finding ways to build trust and journey along together is really key. And greater engagement between application teams and control functions can actually improve delivery quality as well as velocity. Looking, look to embed security um, controls in your application or in your architecture. Moving security up the stack um, allows you to write more targeted uh, controls. And this in, uh, in turn enables you to, to make a more secure environment and enable more features. And this is possible because you can, you can write your controls in a targeted way rather than infrastructure controls that to have to really focus on the um, the, what is entirely possible within the, um, and the lowest common denominator. Use of explicit deny. This can help with your security reviews and add resilience. Uh, and this facilitates the evaluation of key security policies. It also allows you to make future changes uh, to the environment uh, and adds resilience and robustness there and can, creates an extra layer of protection against mistakes. And all of these approaches help to build additional confidence in the solution. And this is really key because it helps achieving buy-in and therefore quicker progress. Now onto migration. We found that cost optimizations can be found with minimal changes. A great example of this is the Twitter sentiment analysis application that Wojtek mentioned. Here we're able to migrate uh, data stored in the online data store, the raw data, into S3 to make use of a cheaper storage tier. <clears throat> but don't forget about behavioral impacts. Granting people ownership um, to their own resources and knowledge of their own cost profile empowers them to make wise choices and use resources wisely. We also found that it's often simpler to migrate all tiers of your application at once. Um, and this is because partial migrations often have to come additional integration challenges such as retrofitting security controls into your on-premise environment. Also, even simple migrations can uh, provide very significant benefits. And they, um, these benefits can range from cost through to operational simplification and also improve time to market. But these cost savings compound on one another and enable you to actually introduce further enhancements. Now, simple migrations also help with building experience. And additional experience enables you to, to take on greater, more, greater challenges um, and with a greater success 
uh, chance. And finally, even with access to only a small number of AWS services, you can achieve a huge amount. Um, in our example of, um, of developing our research data platform, we managed to, to do this in a way that would, wouldn't have been cost effective on premise, even though we only had access to a, a relatively small number of services and not the, the, um, the managed ones that AWS provide. And now I'll hand over to Wojtek to provide final detail on our future plans. So, of course, this is not where we want to stop. We want to look and go forward in a few avenues. One of them would be increasing the platform capabilities, you know, be it better interaction within the components and the models, to better automation, to even further support the flexibility requirement from our business users. Second avenue, obviously, we want to bring in and onboard more and more data sets as the time goes. And the third avenue, we want to start, or not start, but we want to continue keep looking at and investigating AWS managed services. And I already talked about Amazon EMR, but from the same category, AI ML, we also want to investigate and look at the Amazon Comprehend, for example, or Amazon SageMaker. Amazon Comprehend, when you think about it, certain amount of our data is textual, and Amazon Comprehend is a NLP managed service by Amazon. So natural choice for us to investigate. Then Amazon Comprehend, so, excuse me, Amazon SageMaker, uh, we, we want to investigate and see how it would support the flexibility in the terms of a build, train, and deploy pipeline. Then from the category of infrastructure related services, we want to look more closely and investigate the many streams for Kafka or Kinesis, SNS, or SQS in order to see how we can further streamline the, the flow of the information inside the research data platform. And this is everything. So we're going to be on the side for any questions. So feel free to come and ask us any questions. We would be happy. And also, we would like to thank you for coming today. Enjoy the rest of today and also the last day of reInvent. And if you would fill out the questionnaire or survey for us, that would be, we would be very grateful. Thank you very much. And now let's go build. <laughs>